Blog Talk Radio. The motherfucking saga continues. Continue. Yo, yo, what's up, what's up, world? It's badass thugging like I usually do. And you better turn it up, bust some speakers out, because we off the motherfucking cup. You dig how we do it? Dog Pound Gangsters 2000 and beyond. What's up with it, y'all? Man, don't change that down. This is play upon the legendary cocaine. And you tuned in live to Off the Cuff Radio. Better not change that down. Wait, man. Yeah, yeah, this is Cassidy, the hustler. And right now, you listening to the guillotine. Show them the respect they deserve, man. Off the cut radio, man. Y'all already know how they doing it, man. I need y'all to stay tuned. They've been doing it for years. So show them the respect they deserve. And you heard it out of bars, mo. Easy. Keep it moving like this. Yo, this your boy Rampage. You're not rocking with the best. With Off the Cup Radio. Classic. History. Fix your face to all you haters. We Off the Cup, baby. What's up, everybody? This is your girl, Bonnie Dollars, the queen of trap, representing Crenshaw. And you are now tuned in with Off the Cuff Radio. What's up? What's up, y'all? This is Miss Irresistible, giving a shout-out to the live show on Friday nights, Off the Cuff Radio. And I'm live from the 704. Make sure y'all tune in for the blazing hot music. Hmm. What it ain't, what it do. Chili chill from that original lynch mob. Off the cuff radio always was that on Friday night. West West, y'all. All right, all right. We are episode 632, live and direct, Off the Cuff Radio. I'm your host, King Eric the Media Assassin, and this show is sponsored by Da Vinci Clothing, Buddy Boy Entertainment, Screwball Radio. Got my host T Max with the facts on the live. What's good? What's going on, y'all? It's another fantastic Friday on that Freshest Frequency. The other internet intelligence with the outstanding OTC off the radio crew. And shout out to our co-host, and Sarah, our fan man, Lady Chinchilla, and of course, DJ Sincere, Dirty Basement Radio up in New York. And in the long line of legendary guests and legendary shows, ladies and gentlemen, this show is an absolute... Uh, <sighs> I don't even think there are any superlatives, adjectives, or verbs that can describe the magnitude of our very, very, very special guest on tonight. This man is a consummate professional in everything in terms of sports agency and management. There are such big names as Drew Rosenhaus, Arm Tellum, the Poston Brothers, and then there is our guest tonight, Leonard Armado. His name registers and rings bell in the industry as your one-stop shop of everything that you need in terms of helping your career and your brand go to the next level. He is a distinguished legal scholar, lawyer, agent, of 30 plus years and has been counsel to so many countless legends such as Oscar De La Hoya, Shaquille O'Neal, Hakeem Olajuwon, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, among others. He is the founder of Management Plus Enterprises. He is an author, entrepreneur, and trusted right-hand man to so many. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, the man, the legend, the solid guy himself, Mr. Leonard Armado. Welcome to Off the Cuff Radio. <laughs> well, that is quite an introduction, and if I was going on the road, I would bring you with me. Let me tell you that. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> and T, T, T is real cold when it comes to the intros, man. He'll, he'll yeah, make you feel wow. like you he, – he got Michael Buck for beat. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, who's this guy talking about? <laughs> I mean, uh, well, nice I to mean, be here with you guys. Nice to be here. 
Leonard, it is an absolute honor to have you with us. I mean, you're a father, a son, a husband, you know, I mean, so many things that are so many different things to so many different different people, and they mean all the same in terms of sincerity, in terms of how you have touched so many lives. Um, mm. Your career is long. It is distinguished. It is historic. Um, I, I mean, when people think of sports agents, you are one of the it guys. <laughs> I mean, well, you know. That's very sweet. That's very kind. <laughs> what do you want to talk about tonight? Like, well, let's get into it. What is it that interests Absolutely. you? How can I help? How can I serve? Tell me. Well, let's start from the genesis of it, like Nas on Illmatic, 1994 classic mm-hmm. style. Um, <laughs> All, right. I, All right. I mean, let's, uh, obviously, you were well prepared in terms of this endeavor, going back to your days at the University of Pacific playing point guard, you know, mm-hmm. and you, you pretty much, that would help you in terms of how you would be able to do the mo- you know, help others. Of course, Stan Morrison, the former coach of USC, mm-hmm. he's one of your mentors that helps mm-hmm. you along. Yeah. Tell everybody about your journey in terms of where you came from. Um, we got time. Let's get to it. It's about how and how you right. found your way into legendary status. Let's get it. Well, okay. Well, let's start with relationships because people should realize that relationships are the foundation of the journey of your success. And Absolutely. without relationships and without the kind of bonding that you can somehow secure with people along the way, you're never going to make it at the highest and best level in life. And sometimes you don't know when the dots will connect, but ultimately mm-hmm. they will. So treat people with dignity, with respect, and along the way you'll build solid relationships that will serve you down the road when you least expect it. I was a young lawyer after I had finished playing basketball in college. I, was, I had graduated from University of San Diego Law School, and I was a trial lawyer. And I thought to myself, I don't feel fulfilled. I don't feel as if my purpose is actually yeah. being realized. And I called my coach, Stan Morrison, and I said, you know, coach, I, I don't know. I'm a lawyer, but I don't love what I'm doing. He goes, because you should be representing and helping athletes. You are an athlete and you know the mentality and what you should do is use your talents to allow them to maximize their potential, build careers outside of their sports so that they have something to do and lean on when they finish their careers. I said, okay, Mm -hmm. that sounds good, but I don't have any clients. He said, well, you will have to convince someone to hire you or get a job with someone who is already an established agent. Well, I tried to get a job with all the established agents at the time. And this is back in the days when you didn't have these big, you know, companies that were representing athletes. It was just like these gunslingers out there. Right. And they all right. had their, you know, clients and their, their secret, you know, information because none of the information was public and you didn't want anybody else to, to get in on their business. And so everybody rejected me. So Stan said, look, I got an idea for you. I'm going to set you up with a meeting with someone on my basketball team, and maybe you can convince him to represent, for you to represent him. I said, well, there's Mm -hmm. nobody on your basketball team that's going to be in the NBA. He said, no, no, no. He's a two-sport athlete at USC. He plays basketball, but he's one of the greatest football players in America, and his name is Ronnie Lott. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of Ronnie Lott, but he was one of the all, 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 all-time what greats is, in the NFL. Yes, yeah, yeah, the great, one of the greatest safeties. He played for the San Francisco 49ers, four-time, five-time Super Bowl champion. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, so, so Ronnie Lott uh, and I had a meeting, and I sat down mm-hmm. with him, and he looked at me and he said, please tell me about your experience. I said, well, I don't have any experience. He said, well, please tell me about like the accomplishments you have in the sports world in terms of your legal skills. I said, well, I haven't done anything yet. And he said, you have some big firm behind you and, you know, you have some people that are backing you. I said, no, I'm going to be backing me. I'm doing this on my own because I want to pursue my passion. And Coach Morrison thinks I'd be really good at it. And he goes, well, you know, I have all the top agents of the country, you know, soliciting me. So I don't, I don't know if this is really going anywhere. I said, well, let me ask you three questions. He said, what? Mm-hmm. What are your goals on the field? He goes, I want to be a pro. I want to be in the Hall of Fame someday. I said, wow. And I said, well, what are your, your goals off the field? Oh, I want to own car dealerships, be a successful businessman. I said, that's a great goal. And I said, well, what do you, how do you want to be remembered? I want to be remembered as somebody who helped the community. I want to help kids that are underprivileged. I said, wow, that's a terrific goal to have as well. 
And I said, but just think about it for a second. If you were to go with any of these fancy agents that are soliciting you, they would only be able to spend six, seven, eight minutes a day with you because they'd be serving all their other clients as well, and you wouldn't get much attention. But with me, you get 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. I will be fully attentive to you. He said, well, you know, that sounds good, but you don't know what you're doing because you're a rookie. And I'm like, oh, gosh, uh uh-oh. And I said, look, (laughs) look, did any of you guys see The Godfather, the movie The Godfather? You ever seen The Godfather? All right, you saw The Godfather. Now, what was the most famous line from The Godfather? Make you an offer you They'll can't offer refuse. Can't Remember refuse. that? Yeah. Yep, yep. So, you know, I said, let me make you an offer you can't refuse. I'll work for you for free for 30 days and prove myself. And if at the end of 30 days you don't like what I'm doing, shake my hand, I'll walk away. You don't owe me anything. Mm-hmm. And he's like, ooh, that's interesting. I said, he said, why don't you go tell my parents that? So I drove to his parents' house. I said, Mr. and Mrs. Lott, I'm going to work for you some for 30 days, and I'm not going to get paid. I'm going to prove myself. And they looked at each other like, what a nice young man. He's willing to work hard to prove himself. Why don't we, that sounds pretty, pretty good to us. So I said, Ronnie, let's go. Your parents say it's a good idea. So for the next 30, 60, I guess it took him 90 days to sign with me, but he signed with me, and that was the beginning of my career. So that was the beginning, right? So I was representing athletes in the NFL. And after the 49ers won the Super Bowl, the first year I represented Ronnie Lott, all of a sudden I had like half of the defensive, uh, um, um, <laughs> the starting defensive uh, 11 for the 49ers. And then I got into basketball. <laughs> my, first, mm-hmm. my first client was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And, mm-hmm. and I got him yeah. right at the time when he had lost all of his money. His house had burned down. His agent lost. I mean, it was a terrible time for him. But we worked wow. hard to get him back on his feet. And that was the beginning of my basketball journey and I'll go into Shaq in a second, but I want to pause for you guys because I know I've been just like completely like talking for the last two minutes, but I want you to hear about no, no, the, the, the beginning of my Anadotals career. Anecdotals are great. Anecdotals are great. <laughs> go ahead. So, all right. So, so I started representing um, NBA players, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Kim Olajuwon, Kevin Johnson. Remember KJ? Remember how good he was, KJ? Kevin and, Johnson, Phoenix Suns. Yeah, yeah. And so then also this kid, Shaquille, yep, Cal Berkeley, yep, very smart guy, you know, really great player. And I had some of the best that were playing. And then I started to think, you know, what do I really want to do with myself as a representative? And I love the idea of marketing athletes as opposed Mm -hmm. to just doing contracts. Contracts were boring. And Mm -hmm. I had learned from David Stern, the former commissioner of the NBA, Right. Uh, you could use other people's you could be, use other people's money to build your brand. So mm-hmm. you know that was a really interesting kind of concept. You know, get other people to put their money to you know and benefit you, and through their marketing, you would you know grow in value. That's what the NBA did. They had a lot of marketing partners. So with Shaq, we set out to transform the way athletes were marketed. You know, remember, Michael Jordan was the ultimate pitch man. He had so many endorsement deals. But what we said was, Shaq, we're going to own our own IP. We're going to get company. We're going to license it to companies. They're going to use their advertising to grow value in our IP. And all of a sudden, we had a whole coalition of companies that were supporting the growth of the Shaq brand. And all of a sudden, we were doing things that had never been done before with marketing, with movies, with music, with all those things that – Athletes never had an opportunity to really do before at scale, and all of a sudden Shaq was doing it all. Man, now when you think about it, uh, and when I was uh, when I was in the intro uh, we did, when I was thinking about agents, of course, for that time period, Michael Jordan's agent was David Falk. You know, yep. during that time, and that was pretty much, you know, we saw the movie Air. Shout out to Ben Affleck yep. and them on a great job of what they did with it. When you came uh, to Shaq, you all were doing the Reebok deal at the time, and that was what was the what was that like, Leonard, in terms of you all um, facilitating that deal with Reebok to get the dunk, and ultimately how you would all branch that off after he left Reebok to do the dunk um, line. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, so we had to make a decision around what shoe company to go with. And if you know the history of, of the footwear industry, 
at the time, Reebok and Nike were just like fierce, fierce, fierce rivals because Reebok at one time had become the number one shoe company. They had, they had, they had that the fitness shoe, that, that soft uh, um, kind of cushy shoe, that, that aerobic shoe they developed, and everybody was wearing it as a fashion shoe, and they passed Nike, and Nike had to lay off people, and Phil Knight was really, really annoyed you know, at Reebok, and there was quite a rivalry there. And so right. all of a sudden, Nike came up with some great stuff. I mean, they really went after, you know, the the basketball market. They got Michael Jordan, then it was Air Jordan, and then it was Bo Jackson, it was Bo Nose, and then they came up with this funny little saying that seemed to stick, just do it. <laughs> right. So just, just do it, Bo Nose, and Michael Jordan just took Nike on a rocket ship, and all of a sudden... They were the company that really owned the sports business, and Reebok was being left behind. So when Shaq came out, Reebok needed him so bad. And so we went to visit uh, Reebok's headquarters. We walked into Framingham, Massachusetts, I think, right near Boston, where they had their headquarters. And all of a sudden, I looked up, and every single Reebok employee was standing outside of the building, probably like 500 or 700 of them, all wearing T-shirts that said, We Want Shaq. And then Shaq looked up and he goes, wow, you know, and, and they tried to get him to sign on the spot, but he wouldn't do it, you know, because we promised Phil Knight and Nike that we would, you know, we would visit Nike. So mm -hmm. what ended up happening is the following week, we went to Nike to visit. And I came from L.A., Shaq came from San Antonio, Texas with his dad. His dad was stationed at, at, at Fort Sam Houston at the time in the Army. <clears throat> and so I arrived first and Phil Knight was standing outside and Scott Bedbury, who was you know, their big advertising guy and Richard Donahue at the time was the president. They're all outside. They weren't wearing T-shirts or anything, but they were showing, you know, showing respect. So I got there and I saw Phil. I said, hey, Phil, how you doing? I shook hands with him. All of a sudden, looked up, a, a, a car pulls up at Shaq and his dad. Shaq gets out of the car and he's wearing a Reebok Letterman's jacket. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, oh, this isn't going to go over well on Nike campus because Nike doesn't like Reebok. And all of a sudden, Shaq, you know, kind of like rub it in their face. And I'm like, oh, God, I wouldn't have done this. <laughs> but he just decided to do it. <clears throat> if you remember um, from the movie, um, there's a guy named Howard White. Howard White was um, Michael Jordan's, I think, best friend and sort of the attache from, for Phil Knight to kind of be able to communicate with the black community, you know. So he was like the attache. Right. And Howard Knight pull, right. pulls me aside and goes, man, you can't – Phil is going crazy. You can't – let Shaq wear that jacket. Now, Phil is a very stoic man. So you could you right. couldn't tell if he's angry, sad, or anything. I just kept looking at him because I was kind of you know I was kind of like uh, twitching over this myself. I thought, oh my gosh, they're going to be so upset. Phil didn't even bat an eye, but Howard Howard White was going nuts. So he, so I pulled Shaq aside and said, look, take the jacket off. I mean, you know what? This is not good you know uh, um, strategy here. Just you know let him you know don't make him upset. <clears throat> so Shaq took the jacket off, turned it inside out, and we took the rest of the tour. From then on, Nike was like, does he really want to be with us? And they weren't also willing to promise him the kinds of things Reebok was. Because with Reebok, Shaq could be the man. With Nike, they already right. have a lot of athletes already. And so we ended right. up going with Reebok. Right. But I thought you'd like that little story. No, no, no. That's a great story. Because it's one thing about this, uh, Leonard, um, and one thing about Off the Cuff, we have no real set template. Uh, because especially when a guest of such legendary magnitude as yourself, when you talk, we just let you talk because we can build off of that. So there's however long you can stay, we can run any direction with this. When you look at it from, okay. you look at it, you look at it from the perspective of marketing and mm -hmm. uh, it, and famously, I'm a Nike guy, Nike and Jordan. But I respect yeah. everybody in terms of entrepreneurial hustle. And when you look at that time in the 90s, when you look at Bo Nose campaign and you look at Charles Barkley, you had David yeah. Robinson, Chris Mullen, uh, Scotty Pippen was um, – he was yeah. soon Everybody. going on. So the, yeah, so the roster was there. So yeah. – and it plays even to today, Leonard, because when you look at how the marketing is, a lot of athletes want to come in because they want to have everything for them right there. And that's not bad because when you're looking at brand equity and exposure, you want to capitalize on that level of celebrity as much as possible. So it made mm -hmm. sense for Shaq mm -hmm. to go to Reebok because he was going to be the, the, the flag he was going to be the flagship athlete. And that yeah. would definitely um you know, that would definitely go into the Shaq Attack shoes instead of the other. Um, yeah. of course Sean yeah. Kemp 
and so many others will come along later on. Uh, Derek Coleman, I believe, even though he was a British knight, I believe he ended up. Uh, mm-hmm. What's say uh, Derek Coleman? Um, no, no, no. He went with Nike, but he, but he was a British knight. But basically, every brand had a um, had their flagship. Just like um, another anecdotal. Uh, and a lot of people don't know this unless you watch the Last Dance documentary. Michael mm. wanted to sign with Adidas at first. I don't know. Yeah. But the thing was, Adidas was going through a lot of transition. And I read a story years later that said Adidas didn't necessarily uh, want to sign Michael because he didn't fit the stereotypical tall basketball player, i.e. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So they passed him. Mm-hmm. And Nike... Mm-hmm offered Michael a full line in terms of, you know, this is, you know, my, and Michael didn't want to do it. You know, I mean, Michael would tell mm-hmm. you that. But Mama Dolores mm-hmm. and all her wisdom said, boy, they offering you some money and a deal. Go out there to Oregon mm-hmm. and you talk to them. And history was made. Um, yeah. When you got into it, when you all were Pedal to the metal, wheels on the road, uh, Leonard. What was that in terms of how is that? What do athletes and agents of today have to understand about how business was conducted back then in terms of facilitating these deals, getting a marketing campaign, and doing the tours to really maximize the most of that brand? Yeah, well, it's a different world today because athletes have actually more influence on culture today than they've mm-hmm. ever had. And the reason yep. is that they have an opportunity <clears throat> to not only be the face of a brand because of the brand brand's advertising campaign and budget, but they can also go directly in, to their fans and speak to them about their passion for a product. So a lot of right. times you see athletes or celebrities selling direct to consumer because they have so much power over the people that follow them and they can reach them directly through those social media channels that exist out there. So there's a whole nother uh, tool in the toolkit for athletes to become more powerful and to be more influential. And we've seen, you know, athletes utilize that. I mean, Shaq today us- utilizes it in ways. I mean, he's got, you know, o- well over 100 million plus um, fans that he engages with across all of his social platforms. So, it's quite powerful. It's quite interesting. Um, and that gives athletes more power today. So what I would say to anybody who's planning the career of an athlete in today's world is build your social pl- platform, your presence, so that it gives you more influence in culture, makes you more mm-hmm. valuable to brands. And ultimately, you can be a magnet for opportunities because people are going to want to have you associated with them in a whole variety of businesses, whether it's production or private equity or anything else. So the opportunities today for the very, very top athletes are even greater than they were back when we sort of transformed the athlete marketing business with Shaq. Absolutely. Uh, and with the NIL deals that have become so prevalent now in common spaces, they're the norm. Uh, in college, we're seeing a lot of these athletes, you know, Juju Watkins of USC, I believe mm-hmm. she signed her yep. deal with Nike. Uh, shout yes. out to one of my high school, uh, you know, classmates, uh, David Selby. His daughter Brianna, she signed a deal with yeah. New Balance. You know, so yeah. it's a different world in terms of the exposure. Um, Certainly. From that time of it, when what was it like in terms of budgeting? In terms of when you were actually doing commercials, uh, this, that, and the other. In terms of when you all were. Because obviously all of this has, obviously for what Shaq was doing at LSU, of course, with Dale Brown as his coach, uh, he had already, you know, done appearances on NBA Inside stuff, that infamous episode when he broke the bat board, you know. Yeah, I was there. I was, my, my heart skipped a beat, i got to tell you. <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, and of course he ends up at the, you know, um, when he, 1992, he goes number one to the Orlando Magic. Um and this is like makes an instant impact. What was it like not only having him as a client, but him also being the number one pick in the draft to really further solidify it? Well, everybody knew that he was the guy. I mean, there was no question about it from the day that mm-hmm. 
he announced that he was going to forego his last year of college. So we were preparing for that moment. And there was a whole lot of anticipation around him being drafted. But I will tell you that if you have someone who's remarkable like he was, positioning yes, him is oh so important so that the perception of who he is and what he stands for is really, really does resonate with people. So we spent a lot of time thinking of the Shaq brand positioning which was sort of this cross between, remember the Terminator? You know, the, he's yes, like sir. the Terminator on one hand, busting backboards and all that kind of stuff. But on the other hand, he was gentle. He was like, you know, he had this soft, gentle, sensitive side to him where, you know, you felt like he was your good buddy and your best friend. And all of a sudden, you have your best friend who could tear down backboards. And that's a nice little, you know, combination that people responded to in a big way. And then everything mm -hmm. we did with him was designed to promote that, communicate that in a creatively compelling way. Absolutely. Um, one thing about it was Shaq, uh, and he is so many things, a doctor, law enforcement officer, all around great yeah. guy. I don't, I don't think there is a better ambassador uh, of the game and he has been, I mean, co-host of, you know, inside the NBA, of course, with Kenny, Charles, you know, and Ernie. Um, and, of course, now the owner of Reebok, which we got to say it, Leonard, you helped sow those seeds for his business acumen in terms of where he would end up going in business, in terms of the Papa John's, you know, all the all his other endeavors, you know, that he... I was gonna... Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna chime in on this because I want to put this also in historical context. Here. Now he's a, he's in Orlando, and he's about to make that big jump to L.A. You can yep. tell and explain like how vital and how much of a big deal that was at the time because us being two followers of the NBA, we saw this as a monster move. Like you putting two superpowers, which is the Los Angeles Lakers and Shaq, in the same building. That was going to move a needle for real. So, how how what was the challenges behind making that deal happen? <laughs> that is a loaded but very 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 good question. You have a minute for me to explain? We got all sure. day. Go get it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So Shaq, when he was with the Orlando Magic, wanted to stay in Orlando. And he said to me, make a deal with the Orlando Magic. I want to stay here. He already had, you know, three years that he played there, but he had the opportunity. I know he played for four. And so he, his contract was up and he was a free agent so that he could sign a bigger deal with his, under the NBA collective bargaining agreement, with his team that existed as opposed to it going out in the free agency market. It was designed to help the home team have a home court advantage in signing their players. <clears throat> but the Orlando Magic, instead of offering him a max deal, which is typical for any great player, right? I mean, you guys know that. Um, yes, they offered him something less than the max, saying they wanted to save some money for Penny Hardaway, who is, you know, who is obviously a great player, but, you know, they were talking about saving money from the Shaq agreement without even really talking to us about it. So Shaq was a little bit offended by that and thought, you know, that's not very respectful. And then Alonzo Mourning signed a hundred million dollar deal. deal with Miami. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And then Shaq's like, well, look, Mourning's getting 105 million. I'm not taking less than him. And then <laughs> they ran a poll in the Orlando Sentinel and said, is Shaq worth a hundred million dollars? And 70% of the people said, no, of course, nobody had ever gotten $100 million. So they're all going to say, oh, nobody's worth $100 million, right? So Shaq's like, oh, well, go out and see if you can get me another deal. So what ended up happening was Jerry West, the legendary, rest his soul, Jerry West, who was a wonderful yeah, man, the the, probably the, the greatest, logo. probably one of the greatest general managers ever, if not the greatest in the history of the NBA, you know, put together Showtime for the Lakers. And all of a sudden he comes to me and says, we want Shaquille O'Neal. We're gonna, we, we're willing to, you know, trade a bunch of players to make salary cap room for him. So they, they did a deal to trade George Lynch, and he said, I can give you a ninety-six million dollar deal. 
And I said, gosh, you know what? I don't, you know, 96 million. I don't know. Here's the problem. I said, Alonzo Mourning just got 105 and Shaq's better than he is. So why would he take less than 105 million? So what Jerry West did was he said, okay, give me a day. Comes back to me and he says the next day, Leonard, I did something. And if you don't take this deal, I might jump off the building because I don't oh, have oh. anybody left on my team worth playing. <laughs> and I said, and I said, uh, okay, who, who, what happened? He goes, I traded my center, Vladi Divac, and I did made some uh, move this cap room. I got 120 something million dollars for you, and I can give you that. And I also traded for, I think it was the 13th pick in the draft uh, from the Charlotte Hornets, so that I could you know just have somebody to come in. <laughs> I could have somebody to come in and you know supplement the squad. And so, right. and you know that 13th pick turned out to be Kobe Bryant. Kobe you guys Bryant. know that, right? Yeah. So, yes, sir. so what ended up happening was I went back to Shaq and said he did everything we asked. You know, we should be honorable and take this deal if you want to be with the Lakers. And the Lakers had a legendary history of winning. So Shaq said, "Yep, let me let's go." We did the deal with the Lakers. Kobe came to the Lakers, and that was the beginning of perhaps the best duo in basketball history. And, you know, Leonard, it's wild, because I'm going to throw you a curveball with this. Alonzo Mourning actually went to my old high school, believe it or not. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's Talk cool. And I love him. He's a great school. guy. Yeah, he is. He is. Great dude. And that, that's, how, that's, how, that's how wild is uh, how, how past center set, you know, in terms of it. Because I actually had that 1996-97 store sports issue with Shaq on the cover. And he wow. talks about that. Yes, I still have it. I'll send you a picture. Um, oh, that's so cool. But, that's awesome. He, yeah. Matter of fact, I have another book <clears throat> from 1993. Uh, I can't remember. It was, I think it was a package. It was a mini magazine package with Word Up. I'll send that to you as well. I'll, I'll send both of those to you. But um, I remember Shaq saying in an interview uh, that, you know, Alonzo messed the market up. <laughs> you know? Yeah, buddy. <laughs> He's like, he's like, he's like, look, it's between a beamer and a bed. He's like, I'm a bit, I'm a beamer, bro. <laughs> so it's like, so yeah. No, Shaq but, was the Benz. The Benz, that's what, right? That's what he said. He said, I'm the Benz. He said, I'm the Benz, bro. I'm the... So <laughs> I, know, yeah, that's funny. I still remember that. <laughs> yeah, I still remember that uh, quote he made. So it's like, yeah, man. So, and then also too, uh, at that time, you know, Shaq had already coming to lead with a barnstorm of ferocious fury and thunderous might and in, 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 in terms of a hardwood Herculean um, comet we had never seen, you know, of a man right. that big who could move like he did and basically pound the backboard into submission. I mean, a couple of the games we mm-hmm. saw, I think, what was it, uh, New Jersey, I believe, when he uh, got, yeah, he, uh, he, he, yeah, he ripped uh, yeah. yeah, he ripped the whole thing down. The shot yeah. clock hit him in the head. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Um, so we were witnessing. We didn't know it at the time, um, but we were seeing the game change in terms of that type of might uh, becoming a fixture. Yeah. Now, also too. <clears throat> yep. I guess this is also going go into what we call, because Shaq was still in his, he still hadn't even hit his prime yet, but he was already looking at the second act, because of course going to Los Angeles, California, also means movie opportunities. Tell well, he already had that. movie, he already had movie opportunities, because yeah. he made blue chips before he, he, hit, he went right. to the league, he Kelsey. did Kazam, he did, you know, so he already was doing movies and music before he got to LA, so... But well, L.A. was, is, you know, the entertainment capital of the world, so a lot of people associate that with Shaq and being a multimedia star. Right. And that was the extension it would be for him in terms of going to L.A. because it's more opportunities for him outside of what he'd already yep. done. Because like you said, he'd already established himself. Shot of Nick Nolte, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, of course, Penny Hardaway, um, and everybody, mm-hmm. you know, Calvert Chaney, rest in peace to Bob Knight, who was in Blue mm-hmm. Chips as well. You know, yeah, great film. Yeah. Um, and talked about what goes on in college. And so, in terms of, so that's another mm-hmm. story in terms of how the recruiting goes. So, what did you all find in terms of going to Los Angeles in terms of how it would end up uh, adding on to a, a, a budding 
an expanding portfolio of not just sports but entertainment as well. I mean, I, you know, it's interesting. I think it's uh, it was a natural just progression for him. He just kept getting, you know, more mature, smarter, better at doing everything in his life. I mean, you know, in L.A. is where he won three straight championships. So eventually he got on that championship streak, and it was mm -hmm. Bill Jackson who really figured out how to get Shaq and Kobe to play really effectively together. And he was, you know, he's one of the few coaches in the NBA at that time that could command the respect of players making a hundred million or whatever <laughs> dollars. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Phil had those rings and nobody could argue with the rings he had. Yes. Uh, I remember the commercial uh, Shaq did year, you know, right before he won the ring, he said, I have 10 fingers and no rings and I love uh -huh. jewelry. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 yeah. That was that was the one where he was telling everybody he's really committed to basketball. Yeah. Um, when you're looking at it outside of it, um, in terms of the business aspect, financially, making sure that their uh, money is in order. Um, and we have to ask this question, Leonard. Were you the Go one ahead. who called him out about him uh, buying those two uh, those uh, fancy cars after he signed his contract? <laughs> <laughs> you asked him what was he doing? Uh, you know, I mean, I helped him get, <laughs> I helped him get a financial advisor, but I was always pretty conservative about, you know, players doing things with money. I was never into the bling bling, you know, spend all your right. money on stuff right out of the box. But I, I think he, he, the way he tells the story, it was his business manager that balled him out. But gotcha, I might have been gotcha. one of those too. I might have been one of them too that balled him out. I don't know. <laughs> Right, because we heard that story. We just wanted to know who was the source of it. Um, what, but that's also important, too, Leonard, because also, shout out to Billy Corbin, University of Miami uh, graduate, yeah. Uh, yeah. who, of course, did the tremendous documentary, Cocaine Cowboys 1 and 2, and The U, Part 1 and 2, and, of course, One Thirty for 30, uh, in addition to The U, 1 and 2, the documentary broke. Uh, mm. For those who have not seen it, <clears throat> watch it in terms of understanding how athletes can have it all and lose it all. Um, mm -hmm. In your experience, Leonard, what is the most important thing athletes have to understand about not only making the money, but keeping it? I think they have to be surrounded by good people, people that have their best interests in mind and very, very accomplished at what they do. That's really mm -hmm. very important. Um, if you have a financial advisor that's really um, accomplished and really well and, and really has, uh, a, you know, the right kind of pedigree and cares about you, he, you know, he or she will give you the kind of advice that will allow you to live within your means based on your, on your compensation and on your guaranteed future. And then also at the same time, put money away so that you have security. I mean, one of the first things we did with Shaq, I remember, is that we, you know, took like a huge amount of, of money, millions and millions and millions, and just said, you can't touch this. It's, you know, getting put away into a retirement plan, into a annuity, into something that's going to ensure your financial success in the future. And of course, he doesn't need that money now because he's made so much doing so many other things, but at least that was sort of that kind of insurance policy for him, that stopgap measure to just make sure right. he never had to worry about money again. Right. Right. And when we look at it today, uh, you know, it's funny because when we break down different tiers of it, in 1991, Patrick Ewing signed a $33 million extension with the Knicks, which at the time was the highest contract in team sports. Of course, Larry right. Johnson was signed in 19, I believe, 95. Uh, he would get that $86 million with the Hornets. It was, um, mm -hmm. And, of course, Alonzo would get the $105 million, And then, of course, Shaq would get the $120 million. Uh, a few mm -hmm. years later, Kevin you know, Garnett would get the $125 million. So we saw the <clears> exponential <throat> increase. Um you know, I mean, it's a far cry from when Magic Johnson signed his first deal with the Lakers in 1979, and it was, I believe, a $12 million deal for 12 years. 
you know. Uh, well, they, yeah, they had a they did the deal for him. I thought it was twenty million for twenty years or some crazy okay, thing like for twenty years. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You would know. Yeah, about yeah. That. and it was yeah. like uh, Karan was representing Kareem at the time, and he's like, "What the heck is going on here?" <laughs> you know, everybody was freaking out about that, and and uh, you know, it's just one of those things where athletes. They don't really know what the dollars mean per se. They just know from an ego, from a respect standpoint, hey, if this guy's getting this, I got to get that. And, you know, and it's, right. you know that, that's sort of the way they operate. Yeah. And, and then it's the competition factor, of course. Uh, this is off the cuff. You know, we're all knowledgeable of it. Um, but this is definitely your profession. You, you definitely can speak on it with more authority. But when we look at how a lot of times with the money with some athletes, when we look at the situation mm-hmm. that happened in Minnesota Timberwolves, when we look at what happened, yeah. when, supposedly that's the falling out that KG and Marbury had because Marbury was yeah. upset that KG got that money before him, and that's when he wanted out. Yeah. And that's when he went to New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. When, when, you, when you see this, um, what do people have to understand, uh, the average fan, the layman, understand about the inner workings in terms of how these deals are done and how sometimes there can be schisms in locker rooms pertaining to who gets what. Because we all recognize that the star player is a star player. It's funny because Michael, we know him as Money Mike, Michael Jordan. But the funny thing is, mm-hmm. a lot of people don't know He never Michael made Jordan any money. Even, he only made $90 million over his NBA career. And the majority of yeah, his money, he never made the much. real money he made, yeah. You know, the majority of his money was made through his endorsements. But Mike only made like $90 million. Uh, so yeah, and the, was, and the big part of the $90 million was was mm-hmm. like at the very, very end because he was making right. only a few million dollars a year for a while. And, yeah. and you're right. I mean, that's true. And one of the things that people need to just think about is most of these athletes have huge egos. And the reason they have huge egos is because they've been stars their whole life. And they were probably stars in high school. Everybody was telling them how great they are. Stars in college, everybody was telling them how great they are. Then they go into the pros, and for the most part, everybody's telling them how great they are. And when they become even stars in the pros, then it's like, oh, my gosh. You know, they've been, you know, they, they it's almost like the emperor has new clothes. You know, you remember, you remember the emperor's new clothes? Everybody was saying, oh, your clothes are beautiful. He didn't have any clothes on, but they just wanted to say anything <laughs> to make the guy think that, you know, he's amazing. So you get a lot of people around him telling him how amazing they are. And so what ends up happening in the pros is you get these little fiefdoms, you know, these athletes that don't really hang together. They're actually, they go to practice, they go to games, and they go their separate ways with their with their you know, with their group, with their fiefdom. And, and right. you know, the, the fiefdom or the, the posse is telling them how amazing they are and how they're better than everybody else. And, and, those, and so the egos start to get unchecked a lot of times. And when right. you get to, and, and right. I don't blame them, it's almost like, you know, it's almost like Lord of the Rings. Once you experience the ring, you don't want to let go of it. Once you have the power, you don't want to let go of it. Once you have adulation all around you, you don't want to let go of it. And so... You got that affinity goal. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's crazy, but, but you know, I mean, yeah. that was the whole Shaq Kobe thing. They both wanted to be the man on the team, and it was only later that they realized that that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is make your teammates better, make their lives better, make everybody around you better, and then the team is going to survive long term because you're not thinking about yourself, about the ego, but you're thinking about the better or common good. And, and I think as people get more mature, they realize that. But sometimes when you're a, a, you know, an alpha athlete in the middle of your career or in the prime of your career, you think about yourself a lot more than maybe you should. Absolutely. Uh, when, we, when we think about that, too, um, but one thing about Shaq is we have never heard any stories 30 years plus of this man being a disruption, disrespectful in the locker room, being a cancer. Um, I heard that when the Lakers won that first title, you know, in 2000, in 2000, he bought them all Rolexes. I'm like, how can you hate a man like that? He bought everybody a Rolex. <laughs> well, you know, here's the thing about Shaq. He's like, yes, sir. he has a gift. Well, I'll tell you one gift. He, he has two amazing gifts. One, he's the most generous person I've ever met. I mean, I used to, when I represented him, he would not only pay me what, you know, I was entitled to under the agreement. He'd like drive a car for a while. Hey, I'm tired of this car. I'm getting new and here. You take it. I go, no, 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 no. You take it. I'm going to give you this car. <laughs> I'm like, okay. And, and so, you know, he's like that. He gives, you know, you'll see an old lady in a, in a, in a 
you know, tchotchke shop or whatever, you know, and he, she's looking at something. He'll go, he'll just grab it and go, I'm buying this for her. And he'll buy it. He goes out wow. to get his car. He gives the valet a hundred bucks, you know, and the valet's looking at like, what? You know, so that's just him. But I will say about him, he, when he was in the play, in his prime, he wanted to be the man. He wanted to be the man and he wanted to be the, the, the benevolent despot. The benevolent despot is the, you know, the good king. You know, the one who's going to be the king, but giving you all the stuff because he wants to be generous with you. But he wasn't standing for Kobe coming in and saying, you know, this is my team now, just so you know. And I think probably the wiser, you know, the older Shaq could probably go, look, you know what, he's young, he doesn't get it, I'm going to make him feel a little bit more wanted or I'm not, you know, so, so, you know, as you get older, the ego part becomes less important. Humility times tends to set in. And then all of a sudden that just elevates your game. And now Shaq's operating at the top of his game in all respects. Yeah. And, and it's like anything. When we look at the history of sports, um, Leonard, there's always hey, that hey, next hey, move. Hey, okay. Four, six, nine caller. You know, if you have a question to ask, Hold on one okay, second. Four there. six nine, you're on. Four six nine. Hello. Four six nine, you're on. Hey, I'm sorry about that. You're good. Yeah, you can hear hey, me. Hello. Yes, we, yeah, can, hear we can hear you. How you doing, yeah. lady? Miss lady, how you doing? Oh, how you doing? Good, and yourself? We're good. We're, We're doing good. good. All right. Well, thank you. I was listening in, and, yeah, I have a couple of questions for Mr. Leonard here. Um, <laughs> so one of the questions is, um, how does he, how does Shaq balance um, work and family? Okay, I'll tell you. He is probably the hardest working person I've ever met. When I met him when he was young, I said, Shaq, you need to maximize your potential. But the unfortunate part of it is he has potential in so many different areas. The guy's working 24-7. So sometimes he calls me and says, I can't stand you. I go, why? Because you told me I have to maximize my potential and all I do is work. So part of the problem with working the way he has traveling and basketball traveling in his business is sometimes he misses important family moments. So it's been hard for him. So mm -hmm. he loves his kids. He does anything. He'll do anything for them, but he probably hasn't given them as much time as he would have hoped, only because he's been working so hard his whole life. Right. Mm. And how 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 does he manage all those sponsors and business? Because we see him everywhere. I know it's the guy works really hard. I got to tell you. I mean, he he texted me just uh, you know uh, yesterday from Mexico, sent me some pictures of him like in a mall, doing a clinic, then going to retail, then waving at people, then going to do a dinner. I mean, the guy is like, he let the, he goes to the Middle East, he goes to China, he goes, he's like all over the place. So, you know what? He's, like I said, he's the hardest working guy in show business. Mm -hmm. He's hard nice. to keep up with. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, how did he give back yeah. to, his, to his high school? Oh, I mean, he's always giving back all the time. I mean, he was, that's part of his DNA. His parents taught him to give back, and he is always doing that. I mean, I see him all the time, whether it's Shaq Claus or Shaq Giving or, you know, he's got all these different things he does. He has a char big charitable event every year, and he's always giving back to different places, different, you know, people, his school, his, his high, everything. So yeah, he's one of the most charitable giving people I've ever met. Hey, hey yeah. guys! I, I have to, I have to, I have to go. Um, okay. And and run, do something with my. Speaking of family, I have a family obligation, but it's been a pleasure talking to you guys. I hope this was a a good um, little session for you. I hope so. Leonard, well, great. this is absolutely fabulous. We look, we thank oh. you. Tell Shaq he's more than welcome to come on the show if he wants to do it. Uh, Leonard, you're welcome back anytime. And any of your clients, past and present, that you want to bring okay. to us, we would love to have them on. Leonard, thank you again. This has been tremendous. Oh, well, it's a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, guys. You guys are great hosts, and uh, God bless, and see you guys soon, okay? Yeah, absolutely. We'll Definitely. You, Ladies and gentlemen, the, right. the great Leonard Armado. Thank you again, Mr. Armado. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed, man. We Definitely appreciate appreciate y'all joining us for tonight. We're about to close up the shop. Thank you, Marissa, for calling up. You had some real good questions. 
Tell her about the magazine while you're here. Oh, she got it off. She logged off. But, yeah, we're going to be back <laughs> probably next week. Same off-the-cuff radio time, same off-the-cuff off radio channel. As long as Blog Talk act up. <laughs> God bless. Thank you again, everybody, for listening. And we out. Peace, y'all. We out. Kamala Harris is running for president to lower costs for working families. I will help families deal with rising costs. And that's by letting you keep more of your hard-earned money. Under my plan, more than 100 million Americans will get a tax cut. Donald Trump's plan would cost a typical family $3,900 a year. When everyday prices are too high, he will make them even higher. Paid for by FFPAC, FFPAC.org. Not authorized by any candidate or candidates committee. Kamala Harris is running for president to lower costs for working families. I will help families deal with rising costs. And that's by letting you keep more of your hard-earned money. Under my plan, more than 100 million Americans will get a tax cut. Donald Trump's plan would cost a typical family $3,900 a year. When everyday prices are too high, he will make them even higher. Paid for by FFPAC, FFPAC.org. Not authorized by any candidate or candidates committee.